What's going on everyone? This is Mike with Third Dimension Builds and today officially marks the day of my YouTube channel release. Uh, what I'm going to start off with today is sharing my embossing process. It's something that a lot of people have been asking for for a really long time and I thought it's finally time that I shared it with you all. So without further ado, here's the process start to finish. Uh, feel free to reach out with any questions afterwards. Enjoy! <music> So here is my introduction to the embossing process for 3D models. Uh, the software I actually use is known as 3D Builder. It is a free software provided by Windows. Uh, it should be installed on pretty much all Windows computers, but if not, you can find it um, in any of the standard stores. All right, once we're in here, I am going to load an object in. Uh, for the sake of doing so, I'm going to load in Johan's Mark 45, something that I'm sure all of you are familiar with seeing. Uh, there it is. Helmet. And for the sake of embossing, I actually have a blank helmet file. But what this is, is just all the parts combined into one. So I'm not loading everything individually. And since I've done so many of these, for quite some time now, it just makes it easier to have everything together. Quick overview of the hub here. Left click is gonna to be to rotate the object or the screen. Right click is gonna to be to pan. And then the scroll wheel is just to zoom it out. So pretty basic. So here we have the Mark 45 helmet all loaded in, just a standard piece um, off on the right over here. You can actually see the four individual pieces that make up the file. Over here, we do have just a select all and a deselect all, so you can quickly grab what you're looking for. For embossing, what you're gonna need to do is actually select the item that you want to emboss. And in this case, we're gonna say, I'm gonna emboss the dome here. We're gonna come up top and do an edit and emboss. One thing to point out right away is this bevel option up here. This is probably good for larger objects or simplistic objects, but for logos or any lettering, it's not very effective at doing anything. So right away, I'm gonna deselect that. Over here where it says pattern, we drop this down and hit load. This is gonna take us to um, just our file. So I actually have a few test items. I'll pull in here and it's my logo. All right, so what it does is it pops up the picture right on here. So you kind of have an overlay of what it's gonna look like. You can click anywhere on the selected item that you have to quickly drop the picture. Down here at the bottom, we have some scaling. Your X and Y are clearly going to change the size of it. So let's just say we wanna put that to 30 and you can see it changes there or you can actually click and drag the double arrows on here. Whatever's easier for you. Rotate. So this will actually rotate the image from the perspective that you're looking at it. And I know just from doing this so many times that this is a 12 degree pitch, Oops, I'll type that negative. So when I do these helmets specifically, I'm basing it off of this body line right here. Uh, it is a 12 degree pitch. So I'm gonna change that. And then we can click and drag our image wherever we would like from here. Once you kind of have it placed where you want it, uh, let's talk about the next step here. And that is the Z scale. So thinking of the Z scale, just like when you're printing is gonna be the actual height behind it. So if I rotate this off to the side, you can see it's sticking out and that's gonna be 3.02 millimeters currently. Now there are two ways to go about this. Uh, you have your positive embossing and negative embossing, otherwise known as engraving. From my experience, most logos work better when they are engraved, and this is only because it's easier to sand them and work with them. For instance, on this helmet, if I negative emboss this or engrave it, I'm gonna be able to run a palm sander right over the surface of it with little to no issues, and then I'll have to come in and just sand out the details later. Now, if I was to positive emboss this, it would be a lot more work to run the palm sander up against the edges all around here, then run it over the top and then still try and get in between the letters. So 
play with it a little bit, get used to what you prefer on it. But for me personally, most logos work better with a negative embossing. That being said, here's what I've learned over the past two years of doing this. Um, there's definitely a balance of how deep or high up you emboss each of these logos. For me personally, on an item such as Johann's Mark 45, a negative 1.2 is the most effective number I found. It's good for giving it nice depth behind it without going too far into the model and creating a stress point. For positive embossing, I tend to go a little bit further out just because you are going to be sanding down some of that detail. So I will typically do about a 1.5. Again, this is something you're going to want to play with, but rule of thumb for me personally is outward embossing is a one to a 1.5 millimeter. Negative embossing is going to be a negative one to a negative 1.2. If you go too much further than that, it tends to create more issues with sanding and everything else. But again, my personal opinion. So here we go. We're going to do a negative 1.2 on this side. Once it's on there and you hit negative, you'll see that the, the object itself kind of grays out. Uh, it's just letting you know that it's going inward. And you can, if you were to look closely, just because it is so small, you'd be able to see that it's going inside of the model, but kind of hard to see in this case. But once we have it placed and we're happy with it, we're going to go ahead and hit the emboss. And this will take just a minute to process through. And there we are. And just like that, we now have an engraved logo on the side of the helmet. Next, I'm gonna come over to this side and I'm gonna show you an issue that you will frequently run into. So again, I'm gonna hit emboss. The good thing is once you've embossed once, it'll actually pull up the same logo again at the same scaling that you had it at before. So nothing really needs to change there, which is extremely helpful. But I'm gonna go into load once again, and I'm gonna grab this logo. We are going to rotate to a negative 12 since it's on the other side now. Let's place it about where we were. And you may already see what the issue potentially is going to be with this, but I'm going to go ahead and go through with it anyways. So we'll do an outward embossing on this one just for the sake of doing it. Give that just a minute to process again. And boom, right away you might notice that this doesn't look the same as the other side. We have a white square with the letters themselves being uh, flat or recessed in this case, because we did do a positive embossing. Now, if we were to go the other route, let's just do it like we handled on the other side. 12, move it up to here. And then we'll change the Z to a negative 1.2. Give that just a minute to process. And there we go. Now you can see it more clearly. We have, once again, the square is recessed in and the letters are raised. When searching for an image to use in the embossing process, ideally you wanna look for a black and white image. And that's for one reason and one reason only. The software will look at basically just light and dark colors. So if you have a full spectrum of colors, it's going to have a hard time translating between the lights and the darks, and you might not understand how it's going to come out ahead of time. So the way to think of this is any image that you pull into the software, think of black or any dark color as ground level. It's going to be at the height, for instance, of this helmet. Anything black will stay that White or light colors are going to be anything that gets influenced by the Z scale change. So that negative 1.2 millimeters Z height that I input on here is going to be only for anything that is white or light colored in the image itself. That's the reason that we have this white box because the picture was a white image with black lettering. So it essentially ignores the black lettering and only bosses the white. With that being said, one of the most effective tools that you can have is a decent paint software or Photoshop, anything of that nature. So for instance, with my logo that I just did, if I was to pull it up here, we can see that we have the white box with the black lettering. Inside of Photoshop, it's pretty easy to adjust this. So if you already had a black and white image and you simply wanted to change what it's looking at, we can just go up and do an adjustment to invert the image. Boom, just like that, we now have a black and white image and we can use this without any issue because once again, it'll ignore the black 
and only emboss the white. This is something that will take some time in getting used to. More complex images lead to a harder time embossing for it. And having a decent software and playing around with an image enough to get the, the look that you're wanting out of it is something that's going to be key. The most complicated image I ever did was a softball team for a local uh, community. And it was color shaded all over the place. It was atrocious. It, it definitely took me a lot of time inside of um, Photoshop. And I actually used another free software called 3D Paint or Paint 3D by Windows. And that was actually the most effective way for me to modify the image. So take your time, learn how the images are going to be received by the software, and it'll help you out pretty extensively in the long run. But for the sake of this, let's go ahead and emboss this once again with the correct logo. So I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna change this to a negative 12. And I'm actually gonna do a positive on this side, just to show you what the differences would look like. Position it, hit emboss. And there we are. So now you can see on this side, we have the positive emboss logo. And on this side, we have the negative emboss logo. Another cool thing about this software is the fact that you can actually get it in here and paint. It's not gonna be the prettiest, but it definitely gives you an idea of what colors are gonna look like. So in order to paint an object in here, uh, it's easier to do a select all, or you can just simply come in and select the individual items that you want to paint. For the sake of it, I'm gonna do a select all. We're gonna go up to paint and color. And what you have here is your color selection. You can do an eyedropper, you can create your own colors, um, get all kinds of fancy with it. But for the sake of it, I'm just gonna pick a blue. We have a coverage slider. Uh, this just kind of goes over how much it's going to cover of the items selected. And it's based on uh, angles, basically. So we're gonna leave it at 100. I'm gonna come down here to the item or to the object and let's just paint a few of these pieces. We're going to hit OK. And once again, we're going to go back up to Paint. And let's say that I want to paint just the logo itself. So I'm going to drop the coverage down here to, say, 25%, give or take. We're going to pull in the white. And now we can click inside of each of these individual letters. And there we go. Now, if we come over on the other side, we can do the same thing again. And we'll hit OK. And there we are. Just like that, we now have our custom 3DB helmet with a rough mock-up paint job on it. You know, let's go ahead and do the faceplate real quick, too. Uh, we'll select the chin. We'll drop the coverage back down. Oops, don't like that. Ooh, there we go. And let's do the cheek too, why not? And there we are. So just in a matter of a few short minutes, I have a completed rough mock-up for a custom home. Uh, took no time at all. Like I said, the most complicated thing you're gonna run into is how the software utilizes the image and understanding and learning to understand what it's looking for. Uh, biggest thing by far, black and white images will save you a lot of time because it's easy enough to look at a black and white image and go, okay, anything that's white on this image, it's going to look, it's going to emboss. Anything that's black just gets completely ignored. So from a visual standpoint, by far the easiest way to go. Now, let's say that you're all done and you're ready to print this. So what you're going to have to do is break this back up, right? Easiest way to achieve this is to go and select all the images. And let's just say that all I need is the dome. So I'm gonna unselect the dome. I'm gonna hit delete, which clears out every other item except for the dome itself. And now we are free to save this independently. Furthermore, one of the things I like to do inside of the software is actually get in here 
And if I just rotate this a little bit and I hit this, if we go up to object and then settle, this will just fall right down onto the bed. Now this is fantastic for, from a printing perspective because now you don't have to worry about trying to get that proper rotation or anything in place. You can simply drop it this into, you can simply drop this into Cura and you're ready to go. We're gonna go up here to do a file, save as, change the file format to STL. Um, obviously you'd select where you want it to be, but I'm just gonna call this 3DB dome. Save. And if you had multiple pieces to save on here, all you would have to do is just do a couple of backs on here and there's your whole file again. So we could just do a select all, say the back had something embossed on it. Once again, delete everything else. And once again, you come in here, do a file, save as, and we'll just call this 3db back. We can control Z yet again. So now all you would need to do is open up Cura or whatever software you're using. We are going to open up uh, oops, pictures, test, and there's my dome. So we can open it up and here we see it's sitting flat on the print bed. This is actually the exact way that I print these domes. So just easier for me to drop them in this way. And all I would have to do is just scale them accordingly and they're ready to rock and roll. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope it was helpful and that you're gonna take some insights from it. Uh, look forward to seeing you know what projects you all come out with now that you know the process and look forward to more content coming out from me. Uh, my plan going forward is gonna be more of just to follow me along as I build a process, not so much a tutorial, but there might be sprinkles of little tutorials like this along the way. So thank you for everybody who's been there for me this whole time. I greatly appreciate all the support and hope you all enjoy it. Um, as they say, like, subscribe, share out the videos. Uh, appreciate all the support. Take care, everyone.